fun and informative podcast all about training working dogs? Look no further than the LWDG Pod Dog. This weekly show is hosted by me, Joe Parrott, founder of the Ladies Working Dog Group, and I chat to experienced trainers and experts in the field who will give you helpful tips and advice. Whether you're just getting started or you've been working with dogs for years, this podcast will have something for you. So pull up a chair, pour yourself a cup of coffee and tune in to LWDG Pod Dog. Let us help you build a better bond with your best friend. Hello and welcome to another episode of LWDG Pod Dog. This week I'm thrilled to be joined by the amazing Michelle Osman. And once again, we are more than delighted to have you on the podcast. How are you, Michelle? I'm very well. Always delighted to see you too and to speak to everybody. So for those who haven't heard you um, chat before, would you like to tell people a little bit about your background really quickly, where you come from and how you are now an amazing gun dog trainer? Yes, certainly. So um, prior to becoming a full time gun dog trainer, I had a corporate background um, I managed lots of people. Um, and then about 15 years ago, I decided to take the leap of faith into doing dog training full time. I was living up in the Cotswolds and I found that there were a lot of people that were getting gun dog breeds um, and weren't quite certain how best to train them. Having worked gun dogs all my life, um, I found that I was able to take some of the gun dog skills and help people that had companion gun dogs and also people that wanted to compete and work with their dogs as well um, and sort of fell into it really. Um, I really, really enjoyed it. I found that um, the main skill I still had from my corporate background was people. And dog training isn't about training dogs. Dog training is about getting the message over to people um, and getting pe- helping people to get that message over to their dogs. So um, I'm really a people trainer that happens to involve some dogs sometimes. That's a fantastic way of, of describing it. But people won't find you um, in the Cotswolds now, will they? Where are you now? I'm down in Cornwall, down in beautiful, sunny Cornwall, just outside of Bude. And how are you enjoying being down there? Oh, loving it. Especially today, it's about 18, 19 degrees, blue skies, taking the dogs for a bit of a canny cross session across the coast and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's really tough. (laughs) So today's podcast is all about the seven stages to train a positive stop whistle. Now, I know as soon as people have seen the um, name of this podcast episode, they have literally dialed in, downloaded as fast as they can, because stop whistles is one of those things that sort of like baffles people. It's up there with heel work, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. And it's one of those things that is important to have, but people get very hung up on it. Um, and they think that, you know, it's one of those things that's a magical thing to train. It's difficult to train. You have to train it. As with all my training methods, I stripped it right down. I made it very simple. And I just want people to be calm about it and make it fun. And you, as I say in um, the podcast name, I want it to be positive. I want it to be positive for both the owner and for the, hand, uh, for the handler and the dog. It's really important in my mind that people are calm about it and enjoy it and the dog enjoys it. When I blow my stop whistle, I want my dogs to spin around, look at me and go, great, mum, what wonderful thing's about to happen? Not be worried about it. So I want it to be a positive thing. And I think a lot of people get very caught up in it. It's just one of those things that takes time to train. And as with everything, it's one of those things that I'm constantly training with my dogs. There's lots of ways, and I'll talk through that in a moment, that you can bring it into your daily activity with a dog. It's also something that I revisit every year with all my dogs. It's amazing how many of them seem to forget it after a season of shooting. So it's one of those things that you always are brushing up with your dogs. But once they've got it, it doesn't take long to get it back on track. And there is nothing nicer than blowing that whistle and your dog stops and immediately spins around and looks at you with a happy smile on its face excited for what's coming next and that's something I suppose we all aspire to it whether we are going to use our dogs in the field or whether our dog is just a companion or a pet gun dog stops really really helpful isn't it because getting your dog to be able to stop in the middle of a park or before it crosses a road these things are really really pivotal to ensuring the dog's safety 
Oh, so very much so. I'm currently having a lot of building works done. At the moment, they are concreting the whole of my yard. I opened the doors and the dogs went out this morning and I forgot they concreted a whole lump of yard. And I was able to blow my stop whistle and my dogs stopped before they trampled through all this fresh concrete. So that was a situation where it was it was a good thing to be able to have that in my toolkit and be able to stop them and I think whether you work your dogs whether you compete your dogs whether you just have a companion dog it's a lifesaver you never know when you're going to need it um it's just great that you can blow that whistle and straight away the dog stops and you know in the competition world if anybody is going to be doing any working tests or trialing their dogs watching somebody judging somebody who's got a really nice positive stop whistle it makes you feel good watching it when it happens, let alone when the owner does it, the handler does it, and the dog stops and looks and is ready for that next command. It looks smart. It looks nice. Um, it looks in control. It looks like the dog's working with the handler. And the same when you've got it um, out on a walk, as you say, there's nothing better than being out with a load of people blowing your whistle, your dog stops, so you get a really smug smile on your face. And I suppose the idea of a positive stop and a negative stop is quite important because, as you know, I was trained by my dad and I wouldn't say I had a negative stop. But if the dog didn't stop, it was get after the dog. You know, it wasn't I wouldn't say it was in any way cruel, but he only knew one way. And that was to correct the dog, get the dog on the lead, take the dog back to where you blew the stop whistle, blow the stop whistle. It was it was the same thing. But I can almost remember my dogs being a little bit like. I don't really understand why you're like coming to get me and putting me back here. So the idea of a, a dog being happy to hear the stop whistle is quite a, a, an innovative idea. What do you think the difference is and, and why is our training of it so important to get that different type of attitude? It's very simple. If you think about to the way that we used to train stop whistle, you've just mentioned it. What we would do is we would send our dog off. It would be hunting. We would blow a whistle. It had never heard that whistle before. We'd blow it. It would keep running. We'd run out. We'd grab it. We might tug it by the ears. We might put a lead on it. We might give it a shake. We might blow that whistle really hard in its ear and tell it off. Tell it off for what? It didn't know what you were blowing the whistle for. And next, then you let it go again. Then you blow the whistle again. Now, if it was a really clever dog, within about two or three um, shaking downs, it would work out that the best thing it could do was just stop when you blow that whistle. But when the dog stopped, it would cower, almost slightly cower, because it would think, oh, something bad's going to happen if I don't stop. So that was the way. And I do see that still in the shooting field and in the competition field. I can tell when a dog's been trained by that old method because the dog stops and it slightly just dips and cowers or doesn't look at the owner. It's almost as if, you know, when your dog sends something bad in the house and you walk in and none of them look at you. And you're straight away looking for whatever they've eaten or what they've done, what they've shredded, because nobody's making any eye contact. And that's the same with the negative stop whistle. For me, I want to have a dog that is so used to that stop whistle, meaning something good's about to happen, that they are desperate to turn around and make eye contact with me. So the whole process I've built with the seven stages is all about good things always happen when I blow that whistle as far as the dog is concerned so it makes it positive absolutely what you just said is is exactly and you and you can see it in dogs can't you either yeah. it's that cowering or there's that there's that confused look it's like oh it's that whistle that sort of means something do they want me to go towards them i'll creep a little bit i, I won't creep a little bit and, and it, i think for us as handlers we are almost a little bit baffled by it because the dog's quite a distance away from us when we're asking for a stop so we feel a little bit and connected to our dog if that makes sense yeah what do you think is like you say about seven stages to to train in there and that, that's quite a lot of stages that if we miss one I suppose we don't end up with this sort of positive end result so how do we start with these stages right so if you want me to I can take you through the stages and they are built around the process I use so to start with I will be introducing the dog to the whistle yeah, there's no point sending your dog 50 yards away from you and blowing a whistle if it doesn't know what that whistle means whilst it's sat next to you. So I always start off, the first stage of it is I start introducing the whistle. Now that whistle will be introduced at lots of different times. So it might be at feed time. So when I want the dog to sit, I'll blow the whistle. But before I do that, I have to have a dog that sits. 
I've had people come to um, train with me that have tried to get a stop whistle, but they can't even get the dog to sit quietly next to them quickly um, and be still next to them just with a, a verbal command. So make sure you've got that sit command in, a verbal command, and you want a nice quick sit next to you. The next stage is I will introduce my hand into the sit. Because if you think about it, when you stop a dog at a distance, you're going to use quite often your hand to help up in the air to give the dog the stop command and then direct it left or right. So I start using my hand as a sit command. So I will ask the dog to sit next to me. My hand will go up slightly so the dog can see that hand. So the flat of my hand also means the same as SIT. Once I've got a dog that can do that next to me, just sat in the kitchen before I give him his tea or something, I will then introduce the whistle. And the way I will whistle will be quite quietly the first time. I'm not going to be blowing that whistle really hard. First of all, because if you do that, you're going to blow the poor little damn dog's ears out. Secondly, I want to replicate a sound that the dog will hear at 100 yards, say. Well, if I blow it really hard with the dog sat next to me, I've got nowhere to go in regards to the loudness of that whistle when it's a long way away from me. And trust me, I can blow it very, very hard and very, very loud if a dog is heading somewhere I don't want him to. But when the dog is sat next to me, I just want to blow it quietly. So the dog is really listening for it. So now I've got a dog that can sit next to me that will sit if I say the SIT word if I use my hand or if I blow a whistle. And I will play with the dog in the house and I will get it sitting next to me at feed times or just for a biscuit or just calling it into my heel position. And I will try using the sit command verbally, as a hand or a whistle. Sometimes I'll use two together. Sometimes I'll only use one. Does that make sense? You've got a dog now that can sit to whatever you say. Yeah, and I've never really thought before about the um at distance, how they hear it differently. But what you just said makes absolute sense. And I was always trained not to overuse stop. Like, keep them, don't do a lot. You're going to make the dog sticky and all these types of things. So the idea of just gently blowing, making it a positive thing is is quite an innovative idea for me. So yeah, absolutely, I'm fully keeping up with you. Brilliant. So you've now got a dog that can sit next to you, whether you say the sit word, whether you raise a hand or whether you blow a whistle. So that's the first stage done. And because you're doing it with the dog sat next to you, you're getting that eye contact. Um, As I said, I quite often do that at feed time and things like that. So I've got a dog that can do that. Um, Now, I want that to be what I call a quick sit. I want it to be really sharp. I want it bottom straight on ground. Because when the dog is at a distance from you, You don't want the dog to hear the whistle, keep travelling and then slowly turn around and stand and look at you and maybe put their bottom down. So the second stage for me um, is actually getting the dog on a lead, going for a little walk and starting to get that really snappy, quick sit next to me in heel with the dog. Whether I'm blowing the stop whistle, whether I'm using my hand, whether I'm saying the word sit, whatever I'm doing, that dog, as soon as it hears one of those three things or maybe two of them together. So quite often I might blow the whistle and back it up with a verbal command in the hand. The dog's bottom goes straight on that floor. Really, really sharp. Now, some dogs can do this quicker than others. Um, you, your little cockers can wallop their bottoms down really hard. Some of the bigger Labradors they're a bit slower to sit down. Um, And sometimes the girls can be a bit funny about doing it if they're in season or they've just been in season. You know, the foo-foo isn't going on the ground that quickly, I can assure you. Um, You know, young males can be suddenly when they discover they've got testicles between their legs, not so quick to sit. But my second stage is all about getting this really sharp, quick sit next to me so that the dog understands that when it hears that noise or the word sit or my hand goes up in the air, It really, really has to get its bottom on the ground quickly because that's what you want. You are blowing a stop whistle because you want that dog to stop there. Yeah, you don't want the dog to stop in 100 yards. The only thing I would say on that is you start to learn your dog has a stop distance. Um, A bit like when you're learning to drive and you have this braking distance, don't you? You say if 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 you're going at 30 miles an hour, you'll stop in X seconds or whatever uh, or X number of feet. The same with the dog. Every dog is slightly different. 
you know, just, I have a big springer that if I wanted him to stop at A, I might blow the whistle at A, a minus five foot, just because that takes him that speed of his body to slow down. But to begin with, the dog sat next to you just want quick bottom on the ground. So you've got a dog now that is sitting quickly next to you. Now, I do that with the dog on a lead, walking along, and I quickly blow my whistle, I quickly say sit, and the bottom goes down. So yet again, this isn't about going out and doing a specific training session for the stop whistle. All of us walk our dogs. You could do this on your walk. It is also a great tool to help with heel work, because now your dog is watching you and really focused on you, because it doesn't know when that Hit, that sit's going to be asked for. It becomes a bit of a game with the dog. You might do it once every two steps. You might do it 20 steps. And because with my dogs, I, I food reward, the dog will get rewarded as soon as that bottom hits the ground. So I can take my dog out. I could be practicing my heel work with the dog and also practicing my sit, my quick sit, ready for the stop whistle. So that's the second stage. Hopefully you're still with me now. Yeah, I'm still absolutely with you. Right, so now I've got a dog that walking along on a lead, um, and I would say that at this point I might try this off lead as well, just to get the dog used to it. Obviously, if it's on a lead, it's more likely to sit quickly because it's connected to you. If it's off the lead, it can make the choice not to. So I do it on lead, then off lead. The third stage is about um, giving the dog the ability to understand that the quick sit happens and you can keep moving. So you're starting to show the dog that there can be distance. And also starting to show the dog that the quick sit can happen even though you're actually stood in front of them. So the next stage is I've got the dog walking along at heel. I blow my whistle for that quick sit or say sit or put my hand up, whatever I'm deciding to do. Now, if I'm going to do anything at this point and add to it, I would start introducing the fact that my hand is high up in the air. The one thing I would say is everybody must remember that they are tend to be more right hand dominant or left hand dominant. But if you are going to use a stop whistle to direct your dog to go left or right, your dog has to understand whichever hand you put up, that means sit. So don't forget to practice with both your left hand and your right hand. Dogs are so brilliant at taking cues from our bodies that you know I've got lots of people that have only ever done a stop whistle hand in the air with their right hand and the first time they had to do it and then send the dog left it was a right fiasco so get the dog used to either hand means sit so you've now got a dog that's walking along with you you're going to blow the sock whistle and put your hand high in the air the dog will hit the ground with his bottom because at stage two you taught him that what you will do then is drop the lead and walk forward turn to face the dogs only a couple of paces put your hand high in the air and blow that stop whistle again as long as a dog stays sat, you're only two or, two or three paces away from the dog, you go back to the dog, tickle it under the chin or on the chest. The reason I do that is it keeps the dog's head up. My hand is in the air. I tickle the dog under the chest. I take two or three steps back, put my hand up in the air again, blow that stop whistle so the dog understands that when it's looking at me and my hand is in the air and I blow that whistle, its bottom stays on the ground. Then I will return to the dog into the heel position and reward the dog and then off we go again now a lot of people train stop whistle by sitting the dog up calling it towards them and rushing at the dog and putting their hand in the air and stopping the dog i think that damages recall because you know your dog starts to look at you going hold on a minute hold on a minute is this a trick are you going to call me and stop me so i think you can damage your recall like that I would much rather that the dog learns about distance and stopping at distance by me moving away. Hopefully that is explains that quite well enough. You still with me on that? Absolutely. And yeah, and I think you're quite right. Is that who will, you know, when I talk about, they say my dad's in will become sticky. Is that very thing you say, isn't it? If you're rushing at them or they just, they just not knowing what you want from that noise, the way you're explaining the steps, so far the dog's not had you do anything shocking no and the only thing that dog has to do and i've shown it to do and it's been rewarded for is putting its bottom on the ground when it hears a whistle so nice and simple there's no confusion as you say so once you've got that happening um yeah you're going to try that in lots of different places and you might start going 
three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten steps away from the dog. But you always come back to the dog, reward the dog, go away again, and then come back into heel. So it's always you returning to the dog. So you're not going to damage that sit. So that's a stage three. The next stage is a little bit like um, asking the dog to do, do this again, but with a bit more speed. So what you're going to do is you're going to walk away. You're going to be walking along. You're going to ask the dog to sit and you're going to keep walking. So you're starting to put some movement into it. The dog has to sit even though you've kept moving. If at any point the dog doesn't sit, wants to come with you, go back a pace, slow it down. Make it almost like you are stopping because most dogs stop because we've stopped. We want a dog that's stopping on his own or her own because you're, you know, you've taught it to stop with that whistle, but you keep moving. Um, you need to start putting some distance between you so the dog really understands the picture. The picture is I blow the stop whistle, you stay there, I keep going. So now you're starting to put some real distance into it. And this could be 20, 30 foot away from the dog. Always you're coming back to the dog. Yeah. Do not sit there and think I can be lazy and just call the dog to me because you're putting that doubt in the dog's mind. Because if you follow this process by this stage, the dog just knows all it ever does when it hears that whistle is sit and you will come back to it. And that's all you want it to do, because foundationally, you need the dog to understand that sit means sit until I tell you to do something else. If you start recalling the dog or breaking that sit for them, you start putting a doubt in the dog's mind. And we always know that dogs will always make the wrong choice if you give them choices. So whilst I'm training this, um, I will not give the dog any choice. Your bottom goes on the ground and I will always come back to you. Further on through the process, Yes, we start to get the dog to do other things. But to begin with, we stick with this. Now, the one thing I would say is some dogs can pick this up in hours. Some dogs, it could be days and weeks. It doesn't matter. There's nothing wrong with your dog. It's just each dog is an individual. So I never I always say to people when I have a lesson with somebody on the stock whistle, I talk them through all the stages, I show them it. And then I say, now go away and don't think you've got a stock whistle till you've finished all this. If it stops working at, at stage four, go back to stage three, because it just means stage three hasn't been ingrained long enough, especially with a young dog, because we're teaching them so many different things. You know, I always say that training a young dog's a bit like a seesaw. You teach them something at one end and something falls off the other end and then you lift the other end up. So with a young dog, don't be surprised if it seems to be going really well and then they seem to forget to sit. Just go back a stage and just... Go back to what you were doing and getting it right. So we've got up to stage four. We're now on to stage five. Um, this is where I start introducing a reward for the dog that isn't just a treat. Now, it depends what you want to use. I use tennis balls or small dummies for this. I will be walking the dog along at heel. I will blow my whistle. The dog sits. I will spin, spin in front of the dog and put my hand up, but my hand will have in it a tennis ball, the golden tennis ball of excitement. First of all, I'm testing that sit. But more importantly, I will have every eye that dog has got on that tennis ball. So they are really focused on my hand. They're really focused on the tennis ball. I hold it high up in the air. As long as a dog has sat really quickly, and it's focused on me and I'm not very far away from the dog, I will gently drop the ball behind my head, rolling it almost down my back till it lands in my feet behind me. So the ball is now on the floor. I'm between the dog and the ball. So I'm pretty comfortable that if I've got all my sit in and my dog knows what sit means and not to move until I tell it to, I have now stopped my dog and dropped a tennis ball and it's not moved. If the dog stays there and does not move, I will take a step to the side and invite the dog to retrieve the ball. So now this is the first time it really is positive for your dog. Because all of a sudden they stopped and the thing they love, which is retrieving tennis balls, dummies, or whatever they love retrieving, was there when they stopped and they got sent for it. 
all of a sudden this has become a really positive thing. Do you see the connection there? Yeah, you're you're actually blowing my mind a little bit because I'm thinking, oh, why do I, why didn't I think of this before? But yeah, so far it's just been super super exciting. So when you're talking about a dog that stops, turns, looks at you with all this excitement, it's because you've built it up through these steps. Yeah. So now when I blow the stop whistle, the dog's looking at me because it's thinking she's going to have a tennis ball somewhere and she's going to drop it, and I will get a retrieve. Now. The only thing I would say is if you've got a dog, some you know, maybe a young dog that's not that keen on retrieving, you might have to wait to get to this stage where the dog is really keen on retrieving. But most dogs, you can drop something or you could just try some food behind you and send them for the food. Um, it just starts getting the dog used to the idea that there's something good for them there. So you've now got a dog that you can ask it to sit, walk you along next to you, travel away from it, hold the ball high in the air, roll the ball down your back and then send it for a retrieve. So the next stage, stage six, um, I want to do all that, but I want to make it even more exciting. So how do you think I can make it more exciting, Jo? Um, I'm not sure, Michelle. Throw right. the ball, maybe? Oh, yes, throw the ball. But when I throw the ball, I throw it over my head. So I'm still between the dog and the ball. So stage six is all about ensuring that the most exciting thing, which is a tennis ball whizzing over my head and landing behind me, the dog can see it. It's exciting. You put some speed in there, but the dog still stays sat. So up until this point and at this point, the dog is sat when the exciting thing happens. So we're really enforcing into that dog that sits a positive thing because every time it's sat, either it's been rewarded with food as a youngster or in the early stages, or now it's getting rewarded with a retrieve. So sit is really positive to the dog. So what I would do is I will carry on practicing this with the dog at stage six where I'm whizzing this ball out behind me. Um, I might even make some noise as I'm throwing it, but the dog has to stay sat. If the dog moves, and at stage five, if the dog moves, when you roll the ball down the head, you can just step back and stand on the ball or pick it up. If the dog moves when you send them for the ball, sorry, if the dog moves once you drop the ball or throw the ball, do not send the dog. Yeah? Grab the ball yourself if you can. Otherwise, they're self-rewarding. If they did, it's not the end of the world. Don't worry about it. But you'd need to go back a stage and just get that dog comfortable that it doesn't matter whether you throw a ball or whether you drop a ball, it don't go to you, say it. And then we get on to the final stage. Um, Now, it depends how you want to do this, depending what breed you've got, whatever you're doing. I tend to do this in quite a relaxed manner with my dogs. So rather than having a dog out hunting in front of me, I might just take them out for a bit of free running. So I teach a command to my dogs, which is go play, which basically means go off and do what you like. Um, They might be free running in front of me. As the dog passes in front of me and is not too far away from me, I throw that stop whistle in. And my hand goes up in the air with a tennis ball in it. So I've now created the same picture as they've already learnt, but they were the ones moving. And it's, it's almost genius, Michelle, because if you think about it, when we're trying to teach it uh, the more traditional way, we are stopping them from having fun, stopping them hunting, stopping them retrieving, stopping them doing something they really do like to do. In this case, they just doing what they would normally be doing and they hear the whistle and that means that a retrieve is coming. Something good's about to happen. So... The dog's out in front of me. I blow the stop whistle. I always blow the stop whistle as the dog passes in front of me or is near to me because I want to recreate that picture I've taught them, which is you sit, look at me, and I've got my hand in the air with the ball and I will drop the ball behind me. So I almost go back to what we were doing at stage five, but this time the dog's moving. And once I've got a dog that is comfortable doing this, I will start then to allow the dog to... Um, run around or maybe hunt in front of me I will stop the dog and I will start throwing the ball out maybe a bit more to my right or a bit more to my left and over time I will work it almost like a clock face so if you imagine behind me is six o'clock 
I will end up with that ball being thrown out at 12 o'clock, which is over the dog's head. But it will happen very slowly in small increments. I always make it that I can get to the ball before the dog to begin with. But once I'm comfortable that that dog has got a very solid sit once it's sat, I will start like a clock face working that ball or dummy out until eventually I've got a dog that I can have hunting away in front of me. I blow the stop whistle, it stops, ball or dummy comes out, goes over the dog's head. It acknowledges it. It looks turns to look at me. I send it back or it marks it and I send it back but it doesn't go until I'm ready. So that is the seventh stage. You build it up really slowly. If in any time that dog runs in on that, don't get yourself too upset. These dogs, they go, get it wrong sometime. What you're training is the stop and the sit. As long as you've got a quick sit and stop, we can work on the fact they've run in on the dummy or the ball when you've thrown it separately, but you're training the sit and stop. So never mix up what you're training. So just keep focused on that sit. And the way you're training an ale across the seven steps, it doesn't, you know, stop is sometimes seen as almost not an advanced, um, not an advanced command, but it's something you want to leave later on in your training. Yeah. The way you've just described it, you can be advancing it along with your sit, can't you? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I train it with puppies from, most of my puppies by the time they're four months old will stop at a distance. And when I say distance, it's not very far. Because the one thing I would say, and I know this is a common question I get asked, my young dog will um, stop. I'll blow the stop whistle, but the dog will come in so far towards me. That's usually because most of the things you've done with that dog are at the same distance. It's probably about the distance you can throw a dummy. Because a dog has learned that something good happens at that distance. So if your dog is 100 yards away from you and you blow the stop whistle, a young dog will probably come into, I don't know, 10 or 15 yards away from you. But that's because normally when you're tossing a dummy out, that's how far you toss it. So the dog is looking for the positive and it knows it'll be about 10 or 15 foot away from you. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I sometimes think we don't think about all the th- all the things the dog has thought about. Yeah. They're, um, they're very quick to try to recreate the environment, the situation in which they got a positive reward. Yeah, I call it the picture. So the picture I've taught my dogs is what they'll try to recreate. So that's why um, when you're doing things and you're at stage four, stage five, I talk about making you go further and further away from the dog. So you're showing the dog that the picture of a sit and the steadiness and then getting a retrieve isn't just at that 15 foot. It could be at 20, it could be at five, it could be at 100. The dog has learned that the distance doesn't make it up much difference. Young dogs also, it's about confidence. Um, And I have never had a young dog that I haven't had an issue at some time where it's coming closer to me when I've blown the stop whistle. As long as it's not coming back to my feet, I'm not too worried. The distance will come as the dog gets confidence and the dog understands a bigger meaning of life. Um, so I'd never, ever get too worried if I blew a stop whistle and a dog came into me slightly, if it was a young dog. Yeah, it, it's going to want to be around you. It is a confidence issue and it is a youth issue. So don't beat yourself and your dog up about that. Um, but as long as you're getting that quick sit, you can work on it. So I'm sure there's lots of people listening to this now thinking, oh, I wish I'd known this when I was teaching my dog stop. That's the way I would have taught it. But instead, I've taught it the old way or another variation of. Can they just start again? Yeah. Starting the step one and reinforcing this positive idea going forward. Yep, definitely. Um, Most people stop whistle is broken because they've missed one of the steps out. Yeah. So I always say to people, start from the beginning and build it up properly. You've got some some layer of foundation or some some layer within the um, the whole process that isn't instilled correctly in the dog. So if you go right back to the beginning and assume the dog knows nothing, the dog will be happier. Because if you think about it, if you went straight back to the beginning, you'll be starting your dog off in your kitchen at meal times, teaching it to sit next to you. What dog's not going to like doing that? Rather than trying to work out which bit is broken in the stop whistle and fix it. Just just assume it's all broken. Go right back to the beginning and build it up again. 
I do the same with my dogs. If I've had dogs coming for training, residential training, or if I've had dogs that have got retrieving problems, I say, well, let's forget it all. Let's go back to the food bowl retrieve. Let's go right back to the basics and rebuild it again. If you know it's built properly, there's nothing worse trying to mend something that's already broken. So just assume it's broken, go back to the beginning and rebuild it from the bottom up. The forward bowl retrieve we spoke about in the last uh, yes, podcast yes. episode we did together. So if anybody wants to find that, they can go back through the episodes and find that. But to keep on this theme, now sometimes you have those dogs where they're so very, very excited for the next thing. Bums are not on the ground. Bums hover, the hover bum. Um, is that about going back, like you said, back to right back to the beginning, redoing it all, so we get that sharp set? Yes, because the more exciting, the higher the bum will get. So if I haven't got my dog sitting firmly on the ground, turning around, looking at me, sat squarely on the ground in training, when I get it into a live game environment or into a competition environment, I haven't got a cat in hell's chance of the dog even stopping and looking at me. Now, in, in a competition as long as your dog stops and takes direction, you're probably not going to get marked down for the fact that his bum isn't on the ground. But if the dog's bum is on the ground, it is not going to move anywhere. It has actually stopped. Its brain has stopped. Now, whenever I'm um, directing my dogs, be it in a shooting field or in a competition, I will blow the stop whistle and stop them. It's a little bit like taking the dog out of gear and just ask it to come down. If it's hunting really hard or rushing around and it's going the wrong way, I'll blow the stop whistle and go, let's just stop a second. Let's reset things. Let's all calm down. Well, I need the dog's bum on the ground for his brain to re-engage. If he hasn't actually put his bum on the ground and he is stopped and he's sort of like just stood there cocking his head over his shoulder at me, his brain's not stopped. He's still in hump mode. He's still doing what I, he was doing before. I want him to stop. So for me, a hover bum in training will lead to a dog possibly not stopping or only stopping standing and not actually engaging with you eye to eye when it comes to doing it in an exciting environment. I think the hardest thing, I suppose, for a dog when it's surrounded by a live smell and live at a game is the fact that you must have taught it extremely well that it's going to want to stop for what it thinks will be a tense ball retrieve or a treat or whatever, more than what instinct is telling it to do yeah. so it's really important in training that we keep on solidifying it yeah it has to be something good always happens when i hear that whistle now for a dog yes it might have just seen um a, i don't know a pheasant and it's, it's chasing a pheasant has it caught many pheasants probably not that are alive it might fly away but whenever it hears that whistle something good happens so it's back to having a dog that is trained. So some of it is about the dog respecting the stop whistle and actually stopping. Um, and I always start off in, obviously, non-exciting environments. And then I will build it up and up and up into more and more exciting environments. Take a dog into live game environments. Take a dog into where there's, you know, I will take them to the beach where there's lots of other dogs running around the sea, lots of people. And I will practice the stop whistle there. Because if I can't do it there, I've got cat in hell's chance in a live game field when we've got um, a shoot going on. So I have to build it up like everything else. Your training starts at very basic, non-distracting environments and you build it up and up and up. And if at any time I go into a more exciting environment and the dog fails on the stop whistle, I go back to the beginning and quickly run through the stages again and say to him, the same rule applies here. The same rule applies whether you're in the middle of a shooting field, you're on a beach, or you're sat in the kitchen with your food bowl in front of you. That noise means bottom on ground. Look at mum. And what about when, for example, once we've instilled the stop whistle and the dog's got a positive connection to it, mm -hmm. if we're in situations where our dog's decided to be a little bit naughty <laughs> and... Um, is chasing. I can't imagine yours would ever do that, Joe. Is chasing after something or is um isn't taking direction, has sort of gone a tiny bit self employed. We use our stop whistle, bring our dogs back attention back to us. Are we still then? I'm sure lots of people would ask this, are we then still positively rewarding? Yes, the stop whistle. 
unfortunately you have to positively back it up so if I have a dog that so first of all if I have a dog that I've blown the stop whistle and it doesn't stop I will not keep blowing that stop whistle I will go to plan b and that might be turn around walk away it might be hide from the gamekeeper it might be anything but I wouldn't keep blowing that stop whistle because you just validate that command so if I've got a dog that is doing something naughty and I blow the stop whistle and it looks over its shoulder and goes, what? I will always have in my game bag that tennis ball. That tennis ball will come out and be held high. And the dog, because dogs learn through routine and practices, and be- as I say, I, I train behaviourally, which is about creating habits, the brain goes, oh, tennis ball. I sit because I always sit when I see that tennis ball in that position. That's what I hope. Don't get me wrong. Don't always work. But that's the route I would take. If the dog's being naughty, I'd go back to something I have practiced a billion times in a training environment and try to recreate that. Hopefully that the dog's brain will kick into that. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. And for those of us who are thinking, OK, we've got an older dog, we can just go through these. Or we've got a young pup and we're going through these stages. Obviously, there's no set amount of time for stages, but no. we shouldn't fly through them, should we? No, you do not move on until you have got every stage solid in lots of different environments. So as I talked about, um, the first stage, which is just getting my dog to sit next to me, I'll go and practice that in my kitchen, then in the garden. And then I might go and practice it, I don't know, around the chickens. Because I believe the chickens can be let out again soon. So I might go and sit in the chicken pen and practice it. I might go and practice it where there's lots of people. I will practice every stage in lots and lots of different, more distracting environments and build it up slowly. Um, If you do that, then you hope that when you start adding the next layer of training, the next stage, you go back to a very non-distracting environment. So the dog can focus on you and learn that bit of the process. And then you start taking them out to other distracting areas with that bit of the process. So you're never asking the dog to learn something new in a really distracting environment. You teach them the next stage in a calm environment and then teach them that the same rule applies in more distracting environments. I know after listening to this, um, I hope nobody was driving trying to take notes, but people are probably taking quite a lot of notes and we're going to probably grab hold of the dog and go rush back out to do stage one because I think the stop thing is one of those um, commands. We all want to get it right for so many reasons, but we want to do it, like you said, in a really, really positive way. So thank you very, mu- very much for teaching us that. I know you're on our map for our featured experts and experts who can be found around the country training. So people can find you and your details in Bude. But what is your website if they're looking for it um, like straight away? OK, it's mapowders.co.uk. And that's M-A-P-O-W-D-E-R-S dot co dot UK. Um, it's Mapowders Training is the company. Um, we're down in Bude. Um, I do obviously it can always help people online or over the phone Um, I know you're going to put a copy of the hard copy of the document that I've written on this up for people but most importantly you know just just give it a try I rest assured if you understand it and it makes sense to you you can't go wrong with it I've trained lots of dogs myself using this process and I've had lots of clients be successful with it it's like anything though you've got to put the hard work in I'm sure everybody will run to get a copy of the document as well. It's always handy to have something that you can refer back to. Thank you so much, Michelle, for being one of our LWDG featured experts and for once again helping our lovely listeners. We look forward to speaking to Michelle again soon on another different topic. But for now, we'd like to say goodbye and see you all next week. Thank you for listening to LWDG Poddog with me, Joe Parrott. Now, we all know training a dog takes time, energy and patience, but our lives can be really, really busy. Don't worry, the LWDG has got you covered. Join us for our free planning workshop where we'll show you how to use short 10-minute training sessions each day to fast-forward your dog's education. Our experts have years of experience in training dogs and will help you get started on the right foot. Register now and start making progress with your furry friend today. Go to our Facebook page, The Ladies Working Dog Group, and click on the pinned post. Or visit www.thelwdg.com.